Just to tell you a little bit then about Cheshire, Ireland, um, we were established in the late 1960s and what I'll show you is pictures of some of our buildings because the organisation came about um, to provide accommodation to people. So we were left homes and in Ireland, Cheshire, Ireland would be known as the Cheshire Homes and they're classic institutions as you can see. All of these buildings, they're quite beautiful in their own right, but if you have a disability and you're already isolated, the last place you want to be is on the top of a hill on the outskirts of the community, living with 20 or 30 other people with a disability. So we support over 290 adults with mainly physical disabilities, people with acquired disabilities, brain injury and neurological conditions. So quite a range of people. And as we've seen this morning, people in, that have been in roles such as mums and dads and you know, architects and pilots before they acquire their disability and people who were born with disabilities and spent their life in institutions. Um, we also provide respite to people and our figures kind of split roughly in, in, in thirds. So a third of the people we support are still living in institutions. Almost a third of the people we support are now living in the community in their own home. And a third of the people live in what we call kind of cluster arrangements. Would you have them where people have their own apartments, yet they live side by side? And they're still somewhat, I suppose, um, segregated from the, the community. And we have over 700 staff, and I, I think our budget is about, I don't know, 26 million euro, so a lot of money. So to look at why we transformed, the only way I can tell the story is about 29 years ago, I walked into um, an institution and it was the very first day on my very first job having left school and I had never seen a person with a disability before and I walked into a dormitory style room and I saw men and women and boys and girls and teenagers um, and there was nothing but a line of beds and the people were talking and laughing, rocking, crying, making strange noises. Some were dressed, half dressed, naked. And my first reaction was really one of shock. I had never ever seen anything like this in my life. And I was started to question, what is this place? And why do you live like this? Where is your home, your family, your friends? Where are your things, your clothes, your possessions, your photos? And it's a horrifying image, I suppose, that I still hold to this day. I really didn't quite understand why people's lives look so different to mine. So if we fast forward many, many years when I came into my role in Cheshire as the, the quality manager, um, I went and met with the people living and working in all of our services around the country. And I think it was Cameron that asked Michael Kendrick the question this morning, where's the best service? And apparently, Cameron, they're in Ireland because the people I met working in our services told me that these were the best services. And every county I went to, everybody would tell me this is the best service. People are so happy here and life is so great and it's so wonderful working here. And I'd look around and I saw lives that really didn't look like my life or a typical ordinary life. So here I was some 20 years later still questioning why, why, why do people's lives look so different to mine? But now I had the opportunity to do something about it. So with a colleague of mine, Geraldine, what we did over the course of a year or maybe a year and a half, we, we developed our own review tool and we went around and we met with the majority of people living in the Cheshire homes and we asked people what it was like to live here. They were very basic questions around respect and dignity and privacy and their friendships and we asked people what do you do all day and we also asked staff what's it like to work here and what was their opinion on what it was like to live here. And the evidence was absolutely appalling. Um, it, what, life wasn't very good for people and uh, so for the first time we had a way of being able to say to people, this is actually what people told us life looked like. And we wrote a report for our board of trustees and in the report I used the language that we were violating people's human rights. And I was told to settle down, you know, things weren't that bad, Aoife. And I said that we really had to stop congregating and segregating people with disabilities because life wasn't good. And now we had the evidence to show it. So when you have evidence, people kind of start to pay attention. Um, and around the same time, around 2004, Michael Kendrick had begun teaching his course on deep quality. And uh, I remember Michael talking about this course, which was to teach people how to deliver services from scratch. 
And I thought, what a great idea. And I remember going to my colleague and saying, do you know there is a course that will teach you how to develop services from scratch? We don't actually have to start with the building. We can make this for each individual. And people didn't really get the excitement of that, but I knew there was something in that for us. So in 2005, we had about 13 people across the organization do that two-week course. And you talked this morning about the need for providers to kind of deprogram where they were coming from. And, and that was a very important um, time for us in the organization because we learned how to develop services from scratch. Um, and we invested in that course for a couple more years. So, um, and around the same time, one of our homes over in County Mayo was sinking. So there was a problem with the physical building and my colleague said, you know what, we've got to close the home because the building's sinking. And I remember they called me as they were heading west and they said, Eva, we're going to talk to people and we're going to tell them the home is closing because they knew I'd be quite excited about that. And, and I said, and where's your plan? And they said, no, 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 we would be grand. We don't need a plan. Should we just go and have a chat with them and all will be grand. And eight years later, the remaining three people moved out of the home. So while we were getting this evidence and while we were starting to close the services, it wasn't because we wanted people to have a better life. It was because the building wasn't right. And we got into a lot of strife doing that work with individuals and their families, and rightly so. They were, they were very angry because we came and told them the home was closing, and we really didn't have any other plan. We really didn't know how to do it. Um, so the, the most progress came in the last two years of that work when we started just to sit with people individually and with their families and with their advocates and we started to try and figure out what a good life looked like for each person. Our plan at the time back in 2004 was to build a new development but that fell through so we were, we were kind of stuck and we had to try and figure it out you know, one person at a time. So. Um, as you'll see here, the form, uh, inform and transform is really about you've got you to have some sense of there's something wrong here and you've got to have some evidence and some know-how as to how you're going to make that change. And I suppose that's how we started. Um, and this is the, the story of Anne who lived in that home in Balana. And Anne lived there for 14 years. And at one time she would have shared that home with over 20 other people with a disability. And in uh, December 2011, after many years of talking and planning and of nervousness and excitement, Anne moved into her own home in Balana and, as she says, got a life. And um, this is a picture of the home. It's not a great picture, but it is one on a hill on the outskirts of a community. And this is a photograph of the house that Anne um, moved into. And, Anne's life today is quite extraordinary in that now as a, a woman in her early 50s, she gets to do the ordinary everyday things that we all take for granted. So I suppose what we've seen is, is a, a transformation in her lifestyle, her presence in the community, in her roles, which I'll go through with you and with her family involvement. And what Anne says about moving into her new home is, I love the independence I feel in my new home, being able to wheel myself into my own shower and walk in wardrobe and pick out my clothes for each day. I also like having my mother and sister over to visit and having the spare room in my house in case they want to stay. My favorite thing about having my new home is sleeping in my double bed, something we all take for granted. So what we can see now is Anne is able to entertain in her own home and she did have her sister come and stay for the first time at Christmas, you know, and that's a very ordinary thing that we all do is invite our families to stay with us. Um, and Anne's neighbors drop by um, and talk to her about what's going on in town. And Anne's always in town, because anytime I drop in to visit, she's never there. Um, and she loves going out to dinner and to the local pub for a sing song or karaoke. And she also goes to her local church where she enjoys um, being part of the choir. And Anne, like a lot of women, loves to go shopping and particularly picking up things for her home. Um, and her walk-in wardrobe and her ensuite and her recent trip to her, her cruise to Barcelona is the envy of many. And it's not often that we get to envy the lives of the people that we work with, but I've seen her walk-in wardrobe and it's pretty cool. Um, so today Anne is supported to be in valued roles such as a sister, a friend, a neighbor, a churchgoer, an international traveler, a customer in her local community and homemaker, and Anne's life today looks similar to a typical life of a woman her age. Um, and she tells us that she doesn't want to go back to her own home or her life. And that's something that we'd hear people say a lot. Once they move, there is no way that they'd go back. Yeah.